Hello, and thank you for joining me for another time of Bible teaching. Um, today, I want to talk a little bit about context and about trumpets. Okay, I've had a few comments on things, and believe me, when somebody says something, sometimes I'm just like, wow, how do they not get it? But I know how. It's because you got other people teaching things that just aren't right. Um, and everybody, we're just trying to, we see the times, we see how crazy the world is. We want to go home. Um, we see that the rapture is not far away, and we're trying to learn what we can. Um, but sometimes people take things out of context. I've heard it said that a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. In other words, I know it's a mouthful. A text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. It could be a tongue twister. In other words, if you take a verse without the context of what's around it, everything else in Scripture, Without a context, it's a pretext. You are setting yourself up for a proof text where they came completely out of context and being completely wrong. Right. Um, the problem that we have is that people will look at things in the world and say that's a rapture, and then they try to find verses to support it. Rather than understanding Scripture and seeing what Scripture says and then matching that up to the world. Right. To give you an example, we know about these uh, Great American Eclipse. I have video after video. You know, it could be judgment against America. It does. It's not the rapture. There is nothing that says the rapture happens with an eclipse. Actually, it says that the the sun will not give its light, and the moon will turn to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. It also tells you that Elijah comes before the great and awesome day of the Lord. That's the middle of tribulation. Elijah does not come before the rapture. He's one of the two witnesses. He comes after the rapture. And there's actually some eclipses, a solar and a lunar eclipse, that if the rapture were to happen this year, the midpoint of tribulation would be, actually Rosh Hashanah this year, the midpoint of the tribulation would be right about um, Passover on 2028. And in the beginning of 28 and the tail end of 27, there's a lunar and a solar eclipse that happened in Israel. Those are the eclipses I'm looking at. Okay, so there was a comment made trying to show that this is definitely it, the eclipse from 2017 into 2024. I don't know, were you around in 2017 looking at looking at um, prophecy and everything? We were all sure that at that point we were going. We were gone, and we got an eclipse seven years later at the end of tribulation. At that point, I didn't understand Scripture like I do today. But this person pointed to a verse to prove that this was it in Exodus 4. So let's go there. I want you to look at this. And as we read this, so open up your Bibles. Oh, i got to open up mine. Open up your Bibles. I'm just going to read through this passage, and you tell me where do you see the rapture and where do you see an eclipse. We're going to start at verse 1. Then Moses answered in a little context. Um, Moses is being called. You go to the Jewish people and say, hey, God sent me. Hmm. I, I couldn't imagine going out to the world today and say, hey, God sent me. Who's going to, people aren't going to believe you. Anyhow. Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. By the way, do you see what it said Moses answered saying? There's no question. That's a Hebraic way of doing quotation marks. You see it in the New Testament too. Makes you wonder if those passages weren't originally written in Hebrew. But anyhow, so the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he will. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they might believe that the Lord, God of, the, of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, now put your hand in your bosom, and put and put and he put his hand in his bosom, and we took it out. Behold, his hand was leprous like snow. We're almost getting to that the point I want to get to. And he said, "Put your hand in your bosom again." So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out, 
of his bosom, and behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. That's the verse that we've used. That these two eclipses that are crossing America are the first and latter sign. I don't see anything about a rapture. I don't see anything about um, um, eclipses in this passage. Um, you would, Generally, you will see things. Like you might say, awake. The, the last trump is the awakening blast. It awakes the dead. You could see in that day, the Lord of hosts. These are all end times prophecy type phrases. That'll tell you if something has a dual prophecy. You could be talking about being carried off to Babylon, and it says in that day, and you know that it's talking about that. In fact, Joel 1 is all warning about being carried off to Babylon, but several times it says in that day. So there's a parallel to the end times. All right. So you just got to be careful. If somebody throws out one verse, what's the context around it? Because this obviously is not rapture and it's not eclipses. Again, I don't blame the people. I, bl I you know, It's the teachers. It's the people who are teaching. It's everybody's trying to seek. They're trying to learn. They're trying to find out. And there's a lot of people teaching. A lot of people don't understand it. Um, this, this person also said that all that Jewish traditions, no, the Jewish traditions are so messed up. I think it's going to be Pentecost. Hmm, interesting. The Jewish traditions are messed up. Let's take a little roundabout way to talk about this. Let's go to um, Isaiah 46. I find this passage humorous, very humorous. And you've really, in order to get the understanding, you've got to understand what's going on and, and have all these verses that lead up to this to understand what God is actually trying to say here. Um, this is a prophecy about getting taken off to, to um, into captivity. But anyhow, Bell bows down, bells, ah, Bell bows down, Nebo stoops. Their idols were on, on the beast. And on the cattle, your carriages were heavily loaded and burdened to the weary beasts. In other words, they're packing up all their idols like, yep, time to go, getting taken off to Babylon, bring the idols. They stoop, they bow down together. They could not deliver the burden, but they themselves have gone into captivity. In other words, these cattle and everything are just falling out. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been upheld by me from birth, who have been carried from the womb, even to your old age. I am he, even to the gray hairs. I will carry you. I have made you. I will bear you. Even I care. I will carry and deliver you. Oh, excuse me. In other words, they're loading up and trying to carry all these idols, and God's saying, hey, wait a minute, I've been carrying you. He's comparing himself to these idols. Even to your old age, I am he, I'm sorry, I read that. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we should be alike? They lavish gold out of the bag, then weigh the silver into the scales to hire a goldsmith, and he makes it a god. They prostrate themselves. Yes, they worship. They bear it on their shoulders. They carry it. They set it in place, and it stands. From its place, it shall not move. Though one cries out to it, yet it cannot answer, nor save him out of his trouble. When I see out of his trouble, I think out of Jacob's trouble. Could be an end times uh, thing there. Anyhow, so these idols, they can't talk, they can't walk, they can't do anything. And even though they're talking to him, they're treating him like God, they can't do anything. But God has been carrying them all along. Remember this and show yourselves men. We call to mind, oh, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Clearing the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So God has told us the end, but he did it from the beginning. If in from ancient times, things that are not yet done, all the prophecy. That's what we got to be looking. 
at the very beginning, walking with Korah and in prophecy, not out in the world. Right. So let's talk about these traditions. Not quite traditions, but go to Leviticus 23. And I want to talk about feast days of the Lord. Notice they're not Jewish. You think they're Jewish feast days? You're wrong. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the, the feast of the Lord, which you shall be proclaimed to be holy convocation. These are my feasts. They're God's, not Israel's. And people get hung up on this. Speak to the children of Israel. Real quick, let's go to um, Ezekiel 43. Um, this is the glory of God. And he answered and brought me to the gate, the gate that faces to the east. And behold, the glory of God of Israel came from the way of the east. This is Messiah coming in through the eastern gate in the millennial kingdom. Where he's going to reign on the throne of David. Um, the glory of God, Messiah, hasn't been in the temple since uh, the first temple. He left before Babylon. And you can go back and read in Ezekiel 8 how bad it was. And by... Ezekiel 10, the glory of God left. Well, this is Messiah, the glory of God, coming back in. Um, let's go down to 7. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet. What does that mean? That shows ownership. Think back to Ruth and Boaz, our kinsman redeemer, a picture of Messiah. And um, when he took the land and bought the land, the guy selling the land gave a shoe. Because that showed ownership because it had like the dust of the sand. And now you can think about wipe the sand off your dust. Um, you know, when if somebody doesn't uh, follow your, somebody doesn't receive your word, wipe the dust off your sandals. That place doesn't belong to me. I don't own it. I have no ownership there. Anyhow, um, this is the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. Paul told us we're going to be with the Lord forever. If you're not part of the children of Israel, you're not with him. Let's go back to Leviticus 23. And there's two words I want to look up here real quick. Feast days, bad translation. Let's look up that word. Moed. An appointed time, an appointed um, place, appointed meeting. You can read down this. It's an appointment. This word first shows up in... Genesis 1.14, the sun and the moon are for signs and seasons. I know that's not an exact quote, but that word seasons is moe. The sun and the moon are about the appointed times. Okay. The next word we want to look up here is convocation. Nope, that didn't work. Let me get it back. What did I do wrong? Here we go. Please love this. Convocation. Convoking. Kind of the same word. Reading a calling together. You can read that, but look down here. Uh, something called out, a public meeting. Person's place. Also a rehearsal. See, these are rehearsals for God's appointed times. This is the Jews for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Sacrifice the lamb. 3 p.m. is when they were to do it. Messiah, our sacrificial lamb, our Passover lamb, was crucified at 3 p.m. Coincidence? No, not at all. There are lots of things that the Jewish people do that are the traditions, whatever you want to call them, they're rehearsals. Not everything. Messiah butted heads with the Pharisees if you're following around, along in the Bible study in Matthew, we were talking about this, because they added to the law, the commandments of men. Okay, and Those were not good. Isaiah warned them about that. They do that today um, in synagogues because they teach the Talmud. They don't teach um, out of Scripture. They don't teach out of Torah and the prophets. They teach out of the Talmud. That's the commandments of men. So these are rehearsals. There's a lot to be re learned because all of these things they do on these appointed times have set meanings later down the road. All right. So this person was um, 
saying that it could be Passover, or excuse me, um, Pentecost, which is Shavuot. It's interesting. I looked up his other comments, and a while back he was saying, ah, it's the end of tabernacles. A lot of people do that. They'll take the Jewish days and they play whack-a-mole. Remember the game whack-a-mole? Something pops up and you hit it with a hammer. They do each next feast day, next feast day, next feast day. That's it. That's it. That's it. No, it doesn't work that way. You've got to understand these feast days. They scream what they're about, but people don't study them. That's why I've done it. That's why I've done the Bible or the teachings I have about why Rosh Hashanah. All right. So let's go to, I think it's Exodus 19, and look at Pentecost. Exodus 19. Yep, this is it. But before we do, I've got something. I did a screenshot on my phone. I just want to read to you. Give me a second. Okay. It's talking about the fulfillment of Shavuot. Both the giving of the commandment on Mount Sinai and the descent of the Holy Spirit on the Feast of Pentecost. What does Pentecost mean? 50? happened 50 days after the 50th day after Passover. The Israelites traveled around 40 days to reach Egypt from reach from Egypt to Mount Sinai. They left Egypt on the 15th day of the first month and arrived at the foot of Mount Sinai um, on the third day of the third of the first day of the third month. Moses went up to Mount Sinai on the 40th day to meet with God and God came down on the mountain to meet with Israel and gave them the Ten Commandments on the 50th day after Passover. Uh, similarly, Jesus ascended uh, to heaven on the 40th day to join with the Father, and the Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles on the 50th day. So those are two fulfillments of that day. It'd be nice to read the whole thing, but we're going to go down a little bit. Give me a second here. Where do I want to be? To start here. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings, a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people in the camp trembled. This trumpet, we want to know about this trumpet. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. And the, the Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. The smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So there you have man going up, God coming down, they're in a cloud. Could that be the rapture? Sounds like it could be. Remember what you read about that trump? Louder and louder and louder and louder. It could be, but there's a problem. This is Shavuot. I want you to look over here. Where was it? At Shavuot, the shofar or trumpet is blown, often referred to as the first shofar. This flag... Um, Class signifies the marriage union between Yahweh and his people. I see this is when Messiah was wed to Israel. Yes, they were wed together first. Read down in the New Covenant in Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 31, and you will see where God had taken them as his bride. That's the first trumpet. Is that what Paul said? At the first trump, in a, in a twinkling of an eye. Nope. That's not what Paul said. What did Paul say? Let's look up first. Trumpet. Trump in the King James. For the Lord himself would ascend upon the heaven with a shout. Wait a minute. With the archangel got up. Oh, sorry, I did the wrong thing, didn't I? He did not say first trumpet. It's last trumpet. No wonder that didn't look right. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. 
Hmm. Interesting. Thing is, the first trumpet, or the first shofar, is blown on Rosh Hashanah. And you could just Google that and start reading um, through here, and it's going to tell you that. You know what? It's going to show up better if I actually say first trumpet. Um, and just Google, Google this up. Look at it. It is. It is the last trumpet. No wonder. I'm like, how come this isn't showing for me? I Googled this wrong. Sorry about that. The last trumpet, which is blown on Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. Hmm. It's actually the last trumpet blown on Rosh Hashanah. There are 100 blows of the Shafar, nine sets of 11, and one last trump. Um, what's interesting is this last trump on Rosh Hashanah it is believed to be a prayer to God, a long, heartfelt prayer, a blow of the shofar that gets louder and louder and louder and louder and louder. And it's got a name. Um, last trumpet is the, the Kia. I'm terrible at spelling. The Takiya Gedalia, that's the last trumpet, and that's blown on Rosh Hashanah. That's what Paul was telling us, and the twinkling of an eye is an evening, is an idiom for evening twilight. These two trumpets sound the same, the first and the last. The first was blown a long time ago, and you notice it wasn't blown by man, and we know it's going to be a trumpet of God. So it's going to be a trumpet that is blown heavenly. Um, so these are the, these are named trumpets. Now it's was told by the sages of old. I don't know. I wasn't around back then. I missed them by a few years. But that these are the two horns from the ram that was caught in the thicket with um, Abraham when he went to sacrifice his son, and there was another lamb ram that was in the thicket that they used and it's believed that those two horns are the first and the last trumpet don't know it to be true it sounds nice i don't know so you have the first trumpet you have the last trumpet there is another trumpet that's blown give me one second i'm going to pause and find this okay now here's another name trumpet it's called the great trumpet or the final trumpet a chauffeur blast the chauffeur hagadola hagadol whatever is blown on Yom Kippur. Interesting. So we have the first trumpet, which was blown on Mount Sinai, which was Pentecost, already fulfilled. You have the last trumpet, which is blown on Rosh Hashanah, which Paul said the rapture happens at the last trumpet. That's, that's Rosh Hashanah, for the Feast of Trumpets. Now you have this great trumpet. It's blown on Yom Kippur. Let's see if we can find this in Scripture. Let's go to Matthew 24, and this is where post-tribbers get confused. Matthew 24. I don't know how many times I've had people yell at me, see that? Now let me read this through, and then I'll do it. Immediately after tribulation of those days, that's what they yell. Immediately after the tribulation, do you see that? I'm like, yeah. So, of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Is that the rapture? No. We don't see him coming. He's up, in, he's up in heaven with the Father until the Father makes all of his enemies a footstool. That's Armageddon. He comes back at Armageddon at the end of tribulation, not the rapture, because at that point, the, the saints are coming with him. 
and he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. There's your great trump sound of a trumpet. This is Yom Kippur. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This is bringing everybody back where in Isaiah, well, we'll go there. Two places I want to go. Um, how do I want to do this? Um, one verse I'm going to have to look up. So let's do the other one first. See, and I think elsewhere it says it's one from one heaven of earth and earth and from heaven. This is Isaiah 11. And there shall be a root of Jesse. What's the root of Jesse? Messiah. Who shall stand as a banner. That's a rallying point to the people. For the Gentiles will seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. That's Israel. That's Jerusalem. This is when he comes back, and he sets himself up on the throne of David. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will set his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people. And this is north, south, east, west. At this point, when Messiah comes back, and he comes to set up the millennial kingdom in Israel, where he's reigning in Jerusalem, He's going to be bringing people from the four corners of heaven, the four corners of earth, and all those that belong to him are going to be gathered with him. All right. Um, remember it talked about, and the people are going to see him and mourn. I got, to, I got to look this up in my Bible real quick to find the actual scripture. That's going to be the quickest way. Give me one second. We're going to Zechariah. I know that. It's probably 11 or 12. And that's why it's ripped up in my Bible. Yeah. See, this is where we come. This, I just stumbled across this. I'm going to go here real quick. Something I just said. Zechariah 14, verse 5. Um... Yeah, the Lord will come and all the saints with you. So when Messiah comes back, we all come with him. Let me put it another way. In Zechariah, right here, Zechariah, oops, 12.10, and I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. This is the Holy Spirit being poured out on the Jewish people in the millennial kingdom. And then they will look at me, actually it's not the millennial kingdom, um, it is, or just before, so they're going to see in Messiah come back. They will look at me, whom they pierce. So they're going to see Messiah coming back, who they pierce, who they crucified, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. See in Matthew twenty-four. I'm getting a little off task here. My apologies. See where it says, and then all the tribes of the earth. Earth is Israel. The tribes of the earth is Israel, prophetically. These are Gentile nations because they were all around the Mediterranean Sea, mostly. But that's just a lot of times that's how these things are. You see them in Scripture. And so that great trumpet, where else do we see it? Well, it's not going to tell us it's the great trumpet. But let's go to Joel 2. Yeah, I know where I'm going to go. Joel 2. I've done this so many times, but hey, there could be somebody that hasn't seen this before. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. That means it's here. The day of the Lord, the last thousand years, starting with the rapture and tribulation. 
Okay. So it's Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year. That's the Feast of Trumpets. But they're sounding an alarm. War's coming. That's Psalm 83. Read through this. Oh, my goodness. This is tribulation. And there's a call for repentance. Uh, the Lord saying, um, now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your hearts, with fasting and weeping, with mourning. We're going to see this in a minute in Zechariah 10, where the God's calling for them to come to repentance, to come out. Bring your hearts and not your garments. Let's go down here for a little bit. Blow a trumpet in Zion. That's a great trumpet. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. How do I know that's the great trumpet? There is only one required, one God-ordained, one fast required in Scripture, and that's on Yom Kippur. There are lots of other fasts, but they were man-made, such as the Ninth of Av. And Messiah re you know, recognized these. If it didn't go against Torah, Messiah didn't have a problem with these things that man sort of created. But this is the only biblically mandated fast day. So we know this trumpet is bling, being blown on Yom Kippur. And we're seeing Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur bookending tribulation. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out of his chamber and the bride her dressing room. That's Christ coming back with all the saints with him. There's something else down here that's kind of interesting. And I'm going to wrap this up momentarily. Be glad, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully and will cause the rain to come down to you. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Let's look at this a little more. Because you have to take, so as I was saying, you can't just take one scripture like this and make you know, a theology or an eschatology out of it. Let's look at the scriptures that contain the phrase latter rain. I do this as a video about the rains where I spend more time on it. Um, where do I want to go first? I'm not getting them all. I'm missing something. Here we go. They do not say, Jeremiah 5.24, they do not say in their heart, let us fear the Lord of the God, who gives the rain, both the latter and the former rain in their seasons. That's not good if you're, if you're not fearing the Lord. I know somebody asked me to do a video about fear of the Lord, and I probably will. I just have to pray about how that's going to turn out. Um, Hosea 6.3, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. That's a good thing. They, they're not, because the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of understanding. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord, for his going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain. Two things, latter rain and former rain. Israel is a very agricultural economy. It's also almost a drought in the summers. For the agriculture, you have the early rains, the latter rains. The former rains and the latter rains. Joel 2 3. Be glad, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down to you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. There are two calendars and two first months. The former rain was already given faithfully in the first month. The month of Nisan, where Messiah was crucified on Passover, his body was in the grave during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and he rose on the Feast of first fruits. In the first month, in the latter rain, fall feast days, Messiah is going to fulfill, going to be he's going to, the, it's not all in the same year, the rapture is Rosh Hashanah. The uh, end of Armageddon, the end of tribulation, Armageddon is on Yom Kippur, and Tabernacles is all about the millennial kingdom. You got one other thing I'm going to pull up here in a minute. See, and this is Zechariah 10:1. This is where Israel comes back to God in the middle of tribulation. Here is God pleading for him. Ask the Lord for the rain in the time of the latter rain. That's how we know the latter rain is at the end, the end time fulfillment of everything. 
The Lord will make flashing of clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. Grass in the field for everyone is great. Your crops are growing. The, the cows are eating. You get good steak. You're eating good. Agricultural economy. Even James said, instructions to the church. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently until it receives the early and latter rain. You know how we just did a video, a lot of people saw it, about you know looking at the barley, and I'm talking about how we're looking at the barley at the start of the month because you have to wave the sheets at the Feast of First Fruits. When we go to Joel 23, and this is the verse, it's, we've already, this is at the end of tribulation, right? It's, we saw tribulation, we saw Messiah coming back. The threshing floors will be full of wheat, and the vats will overflow with new wine and oil. The threshing floors will be full of wheat. It's not until in the fall, when all the wheat's been harvested and it's all in on the threshing floor. That's when Messiah has everybody back in the millennial kingdom. Got to look up one more thing before I finish this video. Give me a second. Two coats, tabernacles. Tabernacles. One of the main, the two main themes is one. It's the most joyous time of the year. It's also that God will be tabernacling with us. But if you look here and you can do some research, it's also the wedding feast. The wedding feast of Messiah is going to be on Earth during Sukkot. That's cool. And you can dig this stuff up. Be a Berean. Dig into the feast days. Understand them. Understand what they mean. It's the key. God's appointments that he puts on his calendar are the key to unlocking what's going on in the, in the um, prophetic years that we are about to, to come into. They're the key. But most people don't want anything to do with them because they say, ah, they're the Jewish feast days. What does Messiah have to do with the Jewish feast days? We're the church. You know, I've heard that so many times. And if that's the case, what does the death, burial, and resurrection have to do with the church? Because they all happen on Jewish feast days. That sounds ridiculous. So is discounting these, these appointed times. But this is not a whack-a-mole game. You've got to understand them to know what the fulfillment of each one is. Scripture tells us. And remember, these are rehearsals. The Jews have been rehearsing this for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Thank you for watching. May God bless you.